Abraham is a very good example of what it means to be a man of faith. And all of us who want to be reconciled to God are expected to be men of faith. Paul encourages us to walk in faith, by faith, not by sight. And if you want to enjoy God's goodness, they are tied to faith. So it's very important to study the life of Abraham and see how he trusted God and what it meant to trust in God. He could do things that without trusting in God he would never do. Can you imagine sacrificing your only son whom you got in very old age? Your wife is beyond getting any child. And then you are told to sacrifice him. But he trusted in the God who promised that you'd be nations of the earth. He would have, he would have through him nations, not one nation, nations on earth. But then the same God has told him to sacrifice the son. How it will work out? He puts it in God's hands. So he walks by faith, not by sight. By sight, this bad. It's going to return me back where I started. By faith, God knows what he is doing. And I think that's the example we need to get if we are going to be people who trust in God and who believe in his, in his ways. And in, in the, you know, faith qualifies you to be a friend of God, just like Abraham was a friend of God. And that's what uh, James chapter 2, verse 23 is saying. Really, you need to understand you can't be a friend of God because you can't be a friend of someone you do not trust. Friendship is based on trust. And if you claim to have a friendship, even a marriage, if there is no trust, that's a breaking marriage. That's a dying friendship. And so if you really are going to be a friend of God, then you must trust him. You must have faith in him. And that really will be the basis. And, and trusting is not works. It's not something you do. To trust is not to do something. To trust is actually to surrender to somebody else. Believe in the other person. Follow the other person. So it's not something that you, because I trust you, God reward me because I trust you. No. Trusting means I surrender. Whatever you want to do to me, with me, do it. Just look at the, what, what, how Paul puts it. In Romans chapter 4 says, what then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefathers, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. Even in fact, Abraham was justified by work. He had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was created, credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, those you know, whose sins are covered. Verse 8, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. So, Romans chapter 4 is studying the faith of Abraham and uh, emphasizing how we, we also are to copy the same type of faith. You see, Abraham is justified 
by faith. David also is trusting in God. So it, it then means that we need to understand that if we also want to be justified, made righteous, we have to trust God in the same way. First of all, verse 1 and 2 establishes the fact that Abraham had no basis if you want for boasting. And similarly, we must come to God where we know there will be no way we can boast. You know, that's what verse 1 is saying. What then shall we say that, Abra that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in the matter? Even in fact, Abraham was justified by works. He had something to boast about, but not before God. I think that's something very important. He has established before God, there's nothing he can boast about because he trusted in God, then God did. For example, in getting... In getting the, the child uh, um, uh, Isaac, surely we know that biologically it was impossible to get a child. So he just trusted in God, did what a human being can do, and there was a child. How could you congratulate him? It's not something that was within his control. There's therefore nothing to boast about. And the question you need to ask is, do you see God's hand in everything in your life, do you acknowledge that he's the one doing it? Or do you have something you can boast about? Because if you have, then you don't need the Lord. You don't need, uh, you don't need to trust in God. But here, we need to understand that if Paul is your example, and Abraham is our example, the Abraham, Paul is telling you that our forefather Abraham who really trusted in God, has nothing that he could actually boast about. And uh, I think that, that that's something that we we need to take seriously as we think about it. In If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, if there's something he did to be justified, then he would boast. But then it's not him who did anything. He trusted, so he had nothing to boast. No one of us three is saying, what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, <laughs> his righteousness was not based on what he did. His righteousness was based on the fact that he trusted in God. The types of righteous man are ordered by the Lord. It therefore means that you have to understand that uh, for according to verse 3, the word of God already concluded that there is nothing that could have caused Abraham to be proud. Because according to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it's really God who did everything. He had nothing to, he could be proud of himself. Look at verse 4 and 5. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but an obligation. In other words, if you're expecting something from God, then that's a wage you are looking for. That's nothing to, it's not about trusting in God. And I hear people praying, God, you know how much I've worked for you. God, you know what, what this man has done for you. God, you know. And you know here, we are running from Paul, that even Abraham himself could not pray that kind of prayer. He had nothing to qualify him to get anything from God. It was all a gift of God. And so he is saying he was credited with righteousness. Now to the one who works, it's okay to get wages. But the one who trusts, that's not the same. Look at verse 5. However, to the one who does not work but trusts, 
God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So if you, instead of trusting yourself, you are trusting your holiness, if you learn to go to God and trust him, then you can't be credited. You cannot boast anything about. It's God who justifies, who gets all the credit. You, you only thank God for what Yakere did. So, however, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is created as righteousness. That's when you walk in trust of God, when you do things because you trust God, that will be credited to you as righteousness. Trusting is that important. You will be, you'll be accredited as righteousness. So we are, we are learning. Then verse, the next verse is verse 6. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one who, to whom God credits righteousness apart from the works. In other words, this is not just uh, Abraham. Even David, the friend of God, the man of God, has the same, the same, the picture, the same picture. He talks about the blessedness of the one whom God credits with righteousness. In other words, the real righteousness is not something you can earn. It's best when it is a gift of God. Because then, your imperfection, the imperfections of your faith will be overrun by the goodness of God and His grace to credit you with something you don't deserve. That's why we call it grace. Because you are, you are crediting yourself with something you don't deserve. And I think that, that is what we are, we are learning in this thing. You know what David says? He says, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. So, in other words, if you trust in God, you will be blessed because your transgressions, anything you have done that is not pleasing to God, is actually God forgiven. Your transgressions are forgiven. That's why you, since you are already admitting that you don't qualify, when something good comes out of you, it is God who gets the credit. Because you know very well he is the one who has made it happen. And you give him all the all the glory. That will be something that we can we can think about because that's something within our grasp. So work is a reward with wages, but salvation is a gift credited to sinners who accurately turn to God and trust him. But what are you talking about when you talk about sin? You talk about people who break the law. In other words, God has said one thing, you did an opposite thing. How many times is that true of us? But you know, sin goes beyond that. Not just breaking the law. Not trusting in God. God offering such a sacrifice as Jesus. And then you don't care about it. You refuse to get saved. That is sin. When you... Do not want to trust in God. And of course it will be an important thing to understand that unbelief is a sin and ask yourself in which ways have you declined trusting in God. So therefore you cannot be called a man of faith. But sin also is rebellion. You know everything, then you decide to do the opposite. So when you talk about sin, you can sin, we, use, we might sin by breaking the law, we might sin by not trusting God in something, but we might sin by being rebellious. It really doesn't matter which of them we will do. But you need to understand whatever type of sin we are learning, that sin is forgiven by God. That's how you become friends with Him. We are also learning that sin is Covered, not just forgiven, covered. 
You know, when it's covered, it cannot be remembered. It cannot be seen again. And God is able to cover your sin and it's forgotten. Psalms 103 says he takes it as far as east is from west. And also, sin is not uh, put against anyone. Because God wants to ensure that you have not seen and you are not counted. Although you did it, it's not counted against you. That's why David is happy. Because he has put his trust in God. Let's just do it again. The happy or blessed are those who transgressions are forgiven. Number two, whose sins are covered. And it cannot be remembered. Number three, blessed is the one who sin the Lord will never count against them. Those are three different things David is excited about. The sins are forgiven. The sins are covered. They, they, they cannot be remembered. And the sins are not counted against him. He is not held. He doesn't have to pay for the sin. He's not counted against him. That's what it means when you trust in God. When you, you choose to, to work for your own salvation, you would achieve it because you will not get to the standard that God is giving you or asking you to be involved in. You know, this Abraham, actually God circumcised, but he learned his righteousness is not because he obeyed God in, in circumcision. Just look at um, verse, verse 9 and see, see what he is saying, verse 9 to 12. Talking still about Abraham. Is the blessedness, verse 9, only for the uncircumcised? Or also for the, so for the circumcised? Or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before, verse 11. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So, then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then, the one, is then, he then is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So what are we, what are we learning? That uh, circumcision is obedience, just like baptism. We get baptized, but baptism doesn't save. We get baptized as a sign that we are part and parcel of the new covenant. Just like circumcision was, part, was a sign of showing you are part of the covenant. You see, God has forgiven you, he is saying, but not because of things you have done or you are likely to do. We are learning here, Abraham himself was justified even before the actual circumcision. When he put his trust in God and we started the journey, that's when he became a friend of God. He was justified before he was circumcised. And that was a whole 14 years before circumcision. So we can't say that Abraham is a man of faith because he got circumcised. Because there were 14 years when he was walking with the Lord and he was not circumcised. 
You see, circumcision came later, 14 years later, to confirm the friendship he already had with God. It was not the proof of the it was not the cause of the friendship. Because the friendship with God, the reconciliation, had happened earlier. And that's in that's what he is emphasizing in verse 9, in verse 9 and 10. This happiness, this joy, verse 9 is asking. Is it only for circumcised? Or is it also for uncircumcised? How do we answer that question? We look at Abraham's life. And the faith was credi uh, credited to him as righteousness. In other words, trusting is what gave him righteousness. <coughs> and what circumcised was then is asking, was it credited? Was it before or after circumcision? Was it after he was circumcised or before? The fact is, it was not after, but before he was circumcised. And that's what he, he, he wants you to, to understand clearly. So verse, when you now come to verse 11, it now becomes clear you are justified because he was justified because he trusted God's call. He, and he had faith in God that God would walk with him. So in the process, he established that faith rather than circumcision is what gives us friendship with the God. And I pray that you will maintain this trust in God. As he had received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that the that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised. So those of us not circumcised are still children of Abraham, Paul is saying, simply because we trust the same way Paul uh, Abraham trusted. Those who are circumcised and don't trust in God. Don't become friends with God. So it will not be circumcision. It will be, have you put your trust in God? Similarly, it will not be baptism. It will be, have you put your trust in God? And I think that is something that we need to, to look at and ask ourselves. Justified because he trusted in God. And you know that uh, that's something that um, is very, very, very important for us to to get. That's why I think Paul is belaboring the point that I come, that, that the the faith and righteousness that comes by faith that Abraham got got it before he was circumcised. Circumcision was only a confirmation of what God had already done in his life, and I think that's what he is trying to 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 to, to, to get us to understand. Martin Luther the reformer in the 16th century. That's what he discovered. When he read this passage, wow! So I can actually be on my way to heaven despite my failure, despite having sinned against God, despite all my the difficulties of living a holy life. Yes, if I put my trust in God, and you can see how much he got to benefit. John Wesley says the same thing. He had, the, he had the church, he was part of the church, he was a pastor, but then he discovered it's almost impossible to be without guilt. There's always something you have said or done that causes guilt. Then he discovered you can, you can actually go to God and repent. And as you do so, then you gain righteousness given by God. I think that's something that you need to Ask yourself. Looking at verse, looking at verse twelve. In the in Romans chapter four, and the, this is then also. And he is also, the father of the circumcised, who do not who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith, that our father Abraham 
had before he was circumcised. In other words, we are learning, and Paul wants us to establish that the critical thing is not circumcision. The critical thing is do we trust in the God of Abraham? Do we walk in trust? Do we walk by faith? Do we do what he tells us to do, even when you don't understand why we should do it? We just put our trust in him. If you do that, then obviously it will mean that he has credited you or he will credit you with righteousness. And he will credit you with walking in by faith. And that's a really a fantastic promise. So this is a, is a deep discussion on this idea that he wants to establish that Abraham is a great man. Not because of what he did, but because he of the, his trust in God. So he is the father of the uncircumcised because he was himself walking by faith before he was circumcised. He is also the father of the circumcised because he himself got circumcised. Father of the circumcised. But he is only their father, not because they are circumcised with him, but if they behave like him, if they believe in God the same way he believed in God. You know, there's nothing wrong with circumcision. I hear Paul saying, if only we subject ourselves to that faith and trust in God of Abraham. So, we are all the children of, Israel, of Abraham. All Christians are children of Abraham. Why? Because we have put our trust like Abraham. And that is really what makes you now know that the Old Testament becomes your testament. You can see the, the promises of Abraham now have also become your promises. And you can rest assured the way God deals with Abraham, the way he fulfilled promise to Abraham. If you become, if you have the same faith, even you, the promise will be fulfilled in your life. And you are going to walk by faith. What are the advantages of this? Number one, if you walk by faith, it means even when you can't see the way forward, you will still be in peace. Because you know God who knows the way, way forward is still with you. And it's going to help you. So it gives you peace when you are challenged by the future. But number two, it gives you peace when you know that your past is forgiven. That you, God is not God to hold you to account for things you have actually done that are wrong. Either said or done that are wrong. Because all you need is to trust in God and your guilt is gone. You now trust in God. So, so number one, you are assured of your future because you are now, the future is in God's hand. Number two, your past is taken care of because the guilt is removed. But then most importantly, today, you are with him. You trust in him. And so you have peace even for today, not just for tomorrow. And I think that's, that's, that's what, what Paul wants the Romans to accurately understand. Because you see, the, the, in Rome, they are Gentiles, but they are also Jews. And he's trying to address himself to both of them. That they would really have serious trust so that they can walk in righteousness in all ways and be pleasing to God. So, who was Abraham? The father of faith. The father, the ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was told earlier, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That proved difficult for, for hundreds of years. But when Jesus was born in the lineage of Abraham, we now have access, the whole earth has access to this God, to the God of Abraham, in ways that would honor him. May that be the truth you live by. A God who is with you, the same way he was with Abraham. And that because you trust in him, you will not live in fear, 
and you not live in guilt, you will be able to enjoy the goodness of the Lord.